We often feel soreness in the muscles that were trained the previous day. Sometimes this is seen as a positive sign that the training session was effective. However, what does soreness really mean and is it actually beneficial for muscle growth? In this video, we will try to answer these questions. To answer this, we first need to explore what exactly we mean when referring to muscle soreness. This can more accurately be defined as delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS for short. This refers to the soreness we feel in our muscles following exercise. This soreness usually peaks around 24 to 48 hours post exercise and can last several days if the exercise bout was disruptive enough. DOMS can occur after basically any form of exercise, not just resistance training. DOMS can be present after playing sport, endurance exercise, physical labor, and anything else that stresses the muscle tissues. We should also differentiate between delayed onset muscle soreness compared with joint pain or injury. DOMS is the feeling of soreness within the belly of the muscle. This usually only lasts a few days and shouldn't persist until the muscle is trained again. Joint pain, on the other hand, is a feeling within the joints or connective tissue surrounding the joints. This will usually last a longer time frame and may become worse over time if your training isn't managed appropriately. So what causes DOMS? The exact mechanisms contributing to DOMS are not entirely clear at this point in time, although there are several mechanisms that have been proposed to contribute to this sensation. This research review suggested that the primary mechanism which is thought to contribute to DOMS is structural damage of the muscle cells. Then the protein degradation and inflammatory response has been thought to be responsible for the soreness experienced in the following days. However, the exact physiological mechanisms are not all that important when it comes to practical training recommendations. What is more important is to understand that soreness occurs as a result of some form of disruption to homeostasis via exercise. Like we mentioned, DOMS can occur after basically any form of exercise. However, there are certain exercise methods which can influence the magnitude of soreness we experience. The general consensus is that there are a few exercise characteristics that tend to exacerbate soreness. First is training with eccentric muscle actions, which refers to the muscle lengthening while producing force. This tends to result in greater soreness compared with isometric and concentric actions. This isn't all that relevant to lifting because we perform both the concentric and eccentric actions with each exercise anyway. The second factor is training at long muscle lengths. When there is active tension on the muscle in a lengthened position, this tends to produce more soreness compared with training at shorter muscle lengths. For example, performing a behind the back cable curl may result in more pronounced soreness compared with something like a preacher curl. The next characteristic is local muscle stress. Since soreness primarily seems to be a result of local muscle damage, Exercise modalities which significantly stress a particular muscle are more likely to induce greater soreness. For example, resistance training which has the goal of maximally stressing a muscle is probably more likely to result in greater muscle soreness. On the other hand, most cardio modalities such as the rowing machine are limited more by the cardiorespiratory system rather than local muscle stress and are therefore less likely to induce significant soreness. The last and probably most impactful factor which influences the magnitude of soreness we experience is exercise novelty. When introducing a new form of exercise into a routine, trainees are much more likely to experience significant soreness. Even if an exercise modality doesn't seem as though it will produce much soreness based on the previous factors, if you are unaccustomed to it, it certainly can. A common example of this is when we reintroduce a new exercise into our lifting routine and experience soreness after the first few times performing that exercise. Although once the exercise has been performed consistently, the degree of soreness tends to reduce quite substantially and may even be non-existent. This is what is known as the repeated bout effect. This is a general concept that suggests we adapt to stress by becoming better at handling the stress over time. The more we do a certain form of exercise, the more resilient we become the next time we perform this exercise. This was seen in this study on bicep curl training. 20 active men who had not lifted in the last 6 months performed 6 sets of inclined dumbbell curls once per week for 2 weeks. 
This graph shows the reported soreness in the following four days after the first dumbbell curl training session. And as we can see, after this first session, soreness was elevated for at least four days post-training, peaking after 48 hours, as shown in the blue line. However, after this second session one week later, there was only slight soreness in the following few days post-training, which had completely gone away after four days, shown in the orange line. So what we really want to know is how does DOMS relate to muscle growth? Is soreness something that contributes to muscle growth, or is it completely irrelevant? Well, the answer to these questions may be different depending on the context. As an overall concept, we can definitely be confident that soreness does not have a perfect one-to-one -one correlation with muscle growth. This is because, like we mentioned, soreness can be achieved with many alternative forms of exercise, which are well known not to be the most hypertrophic forms of training. A classic example of this can be seen in this study on downhill running. Recreational runners performed a 10 minute run with progressively increasing speeds on a treadmill set to a 10% decline. As we can see, trainees experienced significant quadriceps muscle soreness, which persisted more than three days after training. And as we understand, downhill running is probably not the best way to build muscle. So what this tells us is that chasing soreness for the sake of it may lead you to train in ways that are not the most effective for muscle growth. This is why context is very important in this discussion. Soreness is not a very useful gauge of muscle growth in the wrong context. What we really want to know is if post-exercise soreness from resistance training is a sign of muscle growth. And once again, even in this specific context, it doesn't have a direct correlation. It is certainly possible for muscle growth to occur with very little soreness. This was demonstrated in this study, which aimed to explore how soreness correlates with muscle growth. Trainees performed an eccentric only leg press training routine three times per week for eight weeks. One group went straight into hard training, while the other group performed a three-week ramp-up protocol, where easy training was performed to get the subjects accustomed to the exercise. This graph shows the average quadriceps soreness experienced each week. As we can see, the group using a progressive introduction to the training experienced less soreness across the entire training protocol, shown in the orange line while the group immediately going into hard training experienced much greater soreness in the first week, which then came back down to similar levels as the other group by the end of the study, shown in the blue line. Despite these differences in muscle soreness, this didn't extrapolate to actual muscle growth. Both groups achieved similar quadriceps growth by the end of the study, with only a 1% difference between them. So all this study really tells us is that soreness is exacerbated by novel exercise, which is something we already know. But this doesn't necessarily mean that more soreness will result in superior muscle growth. This can be further debunked when looking at other forms of research too. For example, this study explored the effects of performing the same exercises with two different frequencies. One group performed more of a bro split routine, where each muscle was trained once per week with more sets, while the other group performed a full body routine five days per week with fewer sets per muscle group in each session. Throughout this training protocol, soreness of different muscle groups was also assessed, and as we can see, the group training each muscle once per week experienced much greater soreness across the training protocol compared with the high frequency group who experienced almost no detectable soreness from weeks 4 to 8. And this is expected since each muscle was trained with more volume per session in the low frequency group. However, this once again didn't predict actual muscle growth. As we can see, changes in lean mass were similar between groups, and if anything, there seemed to be a slight trend in favour of the high frequency group who experienced less soreness. So overall, there doesn't really seem to be all that much of a correlation between the amount of muscle soreness experienced and muscle growth. One theory that may support the sensation of muscle soreness is due to the mechanism of muscle damage. This research review hypothesized that muscle damage may be an independent mechanism triggering hypertrophy. It has been proposed that the swelling and inflammation resulting from muscle damage may increase pressure against the cell membrane, resulting in an independent signal for muscle growth. However, this is more of a hypothesis at this point, since this is mechanistic evidence, not direct evidence on actual muscle growth. So I don't think this is strong enough evidence to intentionally chase muscle damage and soreness. 
Another interesting factor to look at regarding soreness and hypertrophy is the concept of exercise variation. We know that soreness tends to be more pronounced when introducing novel exercises into a training program, and after a few sessions, soreness tends to be less pronounced. In the context of resistance training, this may be seen as a positive sign. Trainees may use this as an indicator that once an exercise is no longer inducing significant soreness, it needs to be replaced with another exercise for the sake of variation. This may be a good idea to some extent, but shouldn't be taken too literally, as we may end up changing exercises too frequently, potentially inhibiting long-term muscle growth. This idea was seen in this study, which explored the effects of exercise variation on muscle growth. One group performed the same exercises each week for eight weeks. The other group were randomly allocated three pushing and three pulling exercises for the upper body, and three quad and three posterior chain exercises for the lower body. Both groups performed the same number of sets and total volume for each muscle, just the exercise variants were different. And as we can see in the blue bars, the group training with the same exercises saw superior growth of all quad muscles, which were the only muscles measured in this study. And although muscle soreness wasn't assessed in this study, we would assume that the group training with more variation would have experienced much greater soreness throughout the training program. This is obviously an extreme example of exercise variation, but once again provides more rationale why soreness is probably not always predictive of muscle growth. Although it should be noted that exercise variation can have a positive effect on long-term muscle growth if implemented appropriately. So far it seems that muscle soreness probably isn't all that useful for predicting muscle growth. However, I think that muscle soreness does have some practical utility for lifters. Muscle soreness is essentially just a general indicator of disruption to homeostasis. This means the exercise caused some form of stress, and the body needs to repair the damaged tissue and adapt to the stress. Like we mentioned, soreness is exacerbated with exercise novelty, eccentric contractions, long muscle lengths, and high local muscle stress. So if we start to control some of these factors, then soreness can become a more useful sensation. There are a few potential ways that I think soreness can be used to enhance the effectiveness of our training. First is to improve lifting technique. For hypertrophy training, the goal is to maximally stress the target muscle. While there are textbook ways to perform each lift, small modifications can alter which muscles are stressed and biased over another. A classic example of this is back movements like rows and pulldowns. While anyone can move the weight from one point to another, the specific technique used can notably alter the stimulus we achieve for the back muscles. To know if our technique is effectively training the target muscle, we can use soreness as an indicator, among other sensations too. If we adjust technique and we experience more soreness in the target muscle the following day, that is probably a good sign that your technique was more effective at training that muscle. This is because we aren't introducing any novel exercises, changing muscle actions, or training at different muscle lengths. The only variable which changed is technique. So it is probably an indicator that more stress was directed to that muscle, which is a positive sign for muscle growth. Another practical use for muscle soreness is when selecting rep ranges. While hypertrophy can be achieved anywhere within the approximate 6 to 30 rep range, we may want to be more specific about which rep ranges are selected for each exercise. This is due to numerous factors, such as our individual response to different rep ranges, the characteristics of the target muscle, and the specific exercise that is implemented. These factors can all have an influence on which rep ranges provide the best hypertrophic stimulus in different situations. So trainees can use muscle soreness as an indicator to select more narrow rep ranges that tend to provide a good stimulus. If a lifter finds that an exercise provides more soreness in the target muscle when training in a certain rep range, then this is probably a good sign that it was effectively targeted. This is because the main variables which tend to exacerbate soreness are not changed. And the other practical use of soreness for lifters is that it can help us select effective exercises. While there are many different exercises that can be effective to train each muscle, and there are no inherent best exercises, each lifter may find that certain exercises are more or less effective for them. This may be due to the specific manufacturer of the equipment, our unique anatomical structure, and what exercises feel more or less comfortable for our joints. 
To help us determine what exercises may be most suitable for us, we can use soreness as a general guide of the hypertrophic stimulus that it provides. If an exercise consistently results in soreness of the target muscle, it is an indicator that this may be an effective option for you. This can be compared between exercises to find what feels most and least productive to hit each muscle group. However, we should also understand that this should not be assessed over a short term time frame. This is because, like we have discussed throughout the video, exercise novelty tends to be one of the main causes of soreness. Obviously, if you introduce a new exercise, it will probably cause some soreness, even if it isn't the most suitable for you. Rather, lifters should use this to assess exercise effectiveness across a long-term time frame. If you consistently find that an exercise causes soreness of the target muscle every time you have it in your training routine, then this is probably a good sign that it is providing a good hypertrophic stimulus, also taking other indicators into consideration too. So taking all of this information into consideration, let's now establish some practical recommendations. First, we should understand that from a global perspective, soreness doesn't seem to be all that predictive or beneficial for muscle growth. This is because soreness can occur with any form of exercise, which includes some combination of being novel, including eccentric muscle actions, training at long muscle lengths, and that induces significant local fatigue of a muscle. Even when looking at resistance training alone, there still doesn't seem to be a strong correlation between soreness and muscle growth. There are numerous examples of muscle growth occurring with very little or even no noticeable soreness. However, it can be a somewhat useful sensation to guide training decisions when used in the right way. Soreness can be a general indicator of an effective hypertrophic stimulus for lifting technique, rep ranges, and exercise selection from a long-term perspective. Furthermore, trainees shouldn't rely solely on soreness to make training decisions. Rather, we should use soreness as one indicator in conjunction with other factors too. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.